Okay, welcome to Genealogy 101. I'm Audrey with the Parker Memorial Library in Dracut. Uh, we'd like to thank the Friends of the Library for supporting all of our programming. Um, and our presenter today is Richard Reed. He is the director of both the Friends of Irish Research and the David Allen Lambert Library, which are based in Brockton, Mass. And with that, I'll just hand it over to him. All right, well, I'm glad to see we've got a few here and hopefully we'll get a few more join us. Uh, there are a lot of handouts that I have provided um, that will be, I guess, emailed to each of you. Um, I guess you have to start somewhere and that's what Genealogy 101 is all about. Now, when we begin our journey, and that's really what it is. Um, it is, you have to decide what your original goal is. Are you interested in just your direct family tree? Are you interested in the direct family members? For example, you're adding the siblings in or including all the extensions of the direct family, the, the spouse and all the children, and the, of course their subsequent families. Um, this, this will add greatly to what you have as a final result. When I started out, I was really only interested in my immediate family, you know, going with my parents and grandparents and great grandparents. And I was only interested in the one individual that was the direct ancestor. But that changed very quickly. And I am so glad that I changed and started doing it the way everybody else was doing it because it gave me such a, um, a wide scope of what our family history was all about. Now we have had some people in our family that have been doing this research for over 40 years and they put together a little binder that they gave to all of us and you know, I lost mine for 10 years. It was in a sea trunk in our basement. And I pulled it out and I really went through it line by line, page by page, trying to find information about each individual that was there. My distant cousin that did the work did a great job in coming up with the names, but there were very few dates you had the, you know, the mother, the father, all the children, but there was no dates for them as to when they were born, when they died, when they got married. Um, there was also no proof. Now, it started off, the very first page was, this is the Reed family history. And it started off with my great-great-grandfather and great-great-grandmother and some fairy tale story about some Scottish castle that we may have owned or not. Um, but anyway, uh, everything that was on the very first page turned out to be wrong. The names of my great grandfather, great great grandfather, and great great grandmother were incorrect. They were partially right, but not completely right. And it was a mess. And so it took years to try and figure out what was going on. Now, originally, you know, I was interested in just them, but now I go and expand all the way out so that, you know, a family tree that started with about 250 people now has about 8,000 people. So you want to determine your starting point and the easiest person to start with is yourself because you know your information uh, and then your children and grandchildren and then of course going to your parents and grandparents. Now most of us had a chance to meet our grandparents, not everyone. I did. I got to meet all four grandparents and uh, lived with two of them for a while so it was very good and easy for me to document that part. Again, when I started this journey, I started with my grandchildren because that gave me two extra generations to work with, them and my children. 
and then work back. So it was very easy to get the first five generations. Uh, that was done like in about 30 minutes in one evening. Now, mind you, I didn't have to have a lot of proof for all of them existing because um, I knew them personally. Um, and so that counted for something. But now it's to find out what you can about them. So decide what you want as your goal. Now, the first steps is to find the same type of information for everybody. You want the birth records. Sometimes you'll find a birth certificate. Other times you find in some churches, you'll find a christening or baptism record. Uh, marriage records can be, if it's new enough, a civil record, often just a church record. You have the record birth of the births of the children and any divorce records, death records, burial information. That's something that's very interesting to have. Uh, occasionally, you can find employment information. And that, I find, is very uh, not only interesting, but it's intriguing because you get to find out what your ancestor did. I know that my dad's dad, my grandfather, and his father were both ship's carpenters. And uh, if I could see over my monitor, I would see a dresser that my great-grandfather built. Um, it, it very nicely done um, men's chest of drawers. And he built it himself. And uh, his name was Richard Reed. And it was a Richard Reed, myself, that actually refinished it. So uh, I get to know about them. I have this really old picture of him working at the shipyard in North Sydney, Nova Scotia. Now, unfortunately, the quality of the picture is not one where I can tell who he is in the picture, but he is in that picture. And also finding out where they lived. Now, for my family, the immediate family, it was pretty easy. Uh, they lived in North Sydney, Nova Scotia. And they all the next that they were born most of them in Newfoundland, and the generation before that was in Newfoundland, but in different parts. So I didn't have to really explore too far to find the immediate family. So what do you need to start? The first thing you need is some paper forms, and you have received several of those as your attachments tonight. We'll take a quick look at those. Um, the pedigree chart is the most famous of all because you start with yourself or your children or grandchildren and you just start building backwards. Start with what you know and then work backwards. Uh, occasionally, somebody wants to start with, you know, somebody way back and then build towards the forward, but that tends to lead to a lot of errors. Now, the Reed family in Newfoundland, there were two real branches of it that we know of. There was my ancestors who were poor fishermen and farmers. And then there was the Reed family that I, you know, that I know is not mine. They were wealthy. They owned and built the railroad in Newfoundland. Um, they were in government. They, they, they had money galore. Now, I have not been able to prove that they are any branch of our family at all. So... Paper forms is the best thing to do to start off. Quickly though, you want to migrate to a computer program. And there's a whole bunch of them out there. Uh, some of them are free, some of them are paid. Each one of them have uh, good points. Each one of them have bad points. Uh, one of the uh, most popular ones that's still out there is Family Tree Maker. It was the software that was designed by the people at Ancestry.com. Uh, they no longer own it. They killed it off, and it was bought by MacKiev, a Boston company. But they are a Macintosh company, and a Mac company never knows what to do with Windows software. I can tell you that from almost 40 years of computer experience. Uh, but, again, it's still a useful program. I use it all the time. It's my primary software to use to document initially. But if I want to print out a report or something, I then export the records 
and bring them into one of my other programs like Legacy uh, or Family Tree Builder, which do much better jobs on uh, the printing of reports. So again, whether it is in the paper format or on a computer program that you're doing this, not only are you keeping the basic information, which we looked at in the previous screen, but you want to have documentation. So here's the pedigree chart. This is six generations. Uh, this is going back to your great, great grandparents. Now, for most people, if they can fill this out and get this part done, this, this is as far as they want to go back. Um, one of the problems of trying to go beyond this is finding documentation. Again, uh, genealogy without documentation is mythology. Now, again, my cousin that did the work, you know, said that, uh, you know, we owned, uh, we inherited a Scottish castle. Uh, I've been to Scotland. I couldn't find it. Um, I have found no evidence that, you know, there is a Scottish castle that belongs to the Reed family. It'd be a wonderful find if I could get there for that. But uh, it's, it's just not true. It was family lore. And a lot of the stories we heard growing up are family lore. Now, one of the things I was told growing up was that I was, we were of Scottish heritage. So yes, I went ahead and did a couple of those DNA tests. Matter of fact, I've done five of them now. And uh, lo and behold, um, the Celtic connection that I thought would be in Ireland and Scotland turned out to be all Southern England. Now, that's been revised as more and more people take the DNA, DNA tests, we get revisions. And so now my DNA makeup has up to 27% Scottish. Before it was barely 2%. Um, so have I found my Scottish ancestors? The answer is no. I think I'm pretty close. I think I have found the, my great, great, great grandfather. And the time period would be the late 1700s. And there was a large migration from Scotland down to Southern England for work. And I am hoping to find that my family was part of that migration. So when we start filling in, if we're doing it with the paper form, or if you're doing it on a computer program, you want to fill in whatever information you can find. The birth would be the date and then the place of the birth, uh, the date of the marriage, where it happened, date of the death, where it happened. We can add in here, you know, with some pencil as to, you know, if there's burial information. In the software programs, you have a lot more fields to work with. And so you can put that information in. It is very handy and it's been very helpful in my own family research to find where people were buried because I can send somebody to go look at a gravestone and glean some additional information. And if you can get to the cemetery, you're able to look at other uh, family members that may be buried in the same basic vicinity. So this is a standard form. You receive one of these by email, pedigree chart. And then we have the family record chart. Now this one gives a little bit more information or at least puts it in a format that's easier to manage because you have the husband and wife, their information. Now, the information that you have here is the same information that you would have on the pedigree chart, but it's definitely more organized. And then you can start adding children to it as well. Now, one of the things you have to make sure that you do is that for the wife, you always record the maiden name. That's critical. You know, if you have just, you know, uh, William Reed and Ann Reed, that doesn't help a whole lot. Um, it is, it's something, you have a first name, but that's all you have. And that's, in most cases, it is the maiden name that would be on the marriage record. 
So the, again, that's one of the reasons why you want to look for documentation. Um, I've even seen on some old birth certificates of the children of a couple that they put the mother's maiden name there. That's very valuable information. But I love this family record chart because it pieces it all together on one document for you. Now, the software, there's all kinds of them out there. Family Tree Builder, and um, the link is there for it. it. Again, if you want a copy of the slides, um, just email me. You'll see my email at the end, and I'll send you the PDF, and you'll have the direct hyperlinks for anything I have in here. But Family Tree Builder comes from my heritage, and it is a free software that allows you to build trees. And the, the, uh, the printing of reports is fantastic in it. One of the paid, the, uh, the last three are paid programs. Roots Magic is excellent. Uh, I have that, I use it for certain things. Uh, then Legacy Software, uh, it has now been bought by MyHeritage, but MyHeritage still offers the free one, Family Tree Builder. And then Family Tree Maker is the one by Mac Kiev that was originally done by Ancestry.com. All of them are excellent for recording data. Matter of fact, the easiest one for entering data seems to be Family Tree Maker, which is why I still use it. Uh, Legacy, it's a little harder to put the information in, but once the information's in and you want to build, you know, uh, some type of printout or design, it's much easier. Roots Magic has great tools for doing that as well, as does Family Tree Builder. Ultimately, I think one of the goals of people that are doing their family report, their history, is to try to, to publish a book, whether it just be in a PDF format for their family and uh, each one of these programs give you that capability. Um, I ran mine through my heritage through their online uh, version, and that's a paid software subscription. And they have Build Your Family Tree book. It's a short one. It's only 1,800 pages. I know. It's a nice night's reading, that's for sure. All right. Now. Um, oop, I don't know what I just did. I just changed the size of my screen. There we go. All right, so this is the My Heritage pedigree chart. This is in that family tree builder. And again, it's graphic. It's very easy to, to understand. It's very easy to follow through uh, the information that you have garnered about your family. And uh, this is actually from mine, so it has some of my information in there. And then you can add to this proof. So to prove that my wife and I are married, I have a copy of our marriage certificate in there. I have a copy of my birth certificate. Actually, I have multiple birth certificates for myself. I have the one that I got from the province of Quebec, and I also have the one that came from the United Church of Canada, the baptism record. Both of those are valid when it comes time to prove that you were born or anybody was born. Again, a lot of places, if you're doing Irish research, uh, there are no civil records before 1864. So if you're looking for a civil birth certificate before 1864, forget it. It doesn't exist. You have to rely on church records. Um, and church records are valid. So one of the things we've learned about for Ireland in particular is that uh, anybody that has a grandparent that was born in Ireland is eligible to get an Irish citizenship and an Irish passport. And so we've helped a number of people to be able to do this. So uh, what you have to find is the church records, and then you're able to uh, make a request and get an original document of it. And that's what the consulate will use. Send it back to Ireland. And then they send you your citizenship papers and your passport. It's, you know, proof. Have to prove it. Cannot say, well, my grandmother told me. 
Now, in my family, dad's mom was the keeper of all family secrets. And she kept some doozies in the background that she never told us about. But if we wanted to know about anybody in the family, you ask her. Matter of fact, every Christmas Eve, she threw a party at her house. And through the evening, starting at 4 p.m. and going to about 2 a.m., there would be a couple hundred people would show up. They used to joke that the, the community of Westmount, which was across the harbor from us, that everybody there was our relative. And I kind of believe it because, I mean, it seems like all of Westmount was empty on Christmas Eve because they were all over at my grandmother's house. Uh, but just because Nan said so did not make it true and my cousin that did this book some 40 years ago she does give some credit in it. on page one after she started the introduction to the family she thanked and gave credit to my grandmother as the only source for all the information i know nan was great she knew it all but she didn't have the documentation she didn't have the proof. After she passed, we did find some of the proof in the, in the bureau in her dining uh, living room. There were a lot of newspaper clippings and there were actually some birth and death records and all that was just stuffed in a drawer, but it was all in her head. Well, that's not a good way of doing it. Putting it down on paper, whether it is the old fashioned manual way or a computerized way is the way to do it. So where are some of the online research homes that you want to look at? Uh, find my past if you have people that are in England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland. That is, they are the best source for that area. Uh, Ancestry.com is absolutely phenomenal for the United States and Canada and much of the world, particularly Europe. My heritage is my favorite of them all. Uh, they cover everybody else. They have wonderful records for everyone. Uh, in, of course, America, Canada, and of course, across the world and some obscure countries where they're the only source for records. I remember probably about three years ago now, I was down in uh, one of the genealogy meetings on a Saturday uh, afternoon, and the speaker was talking about Portuguese records. And I'll be honest, I knew absolutely nothing about Portuguese records, um, particularly for the Azores. I knew nothing about it. So the, the, the person was speaking very authoritatively on it, came to a couple of slides and said, ah, let's not even bother with this because, you know, uh, it's all images you'll never find unless you happen to know what town and what church and, you know, uh, it, it, the exact date already, you're never going to find the records. This is what they're telling, the person was telling us. And I was thinking like, I thought I just got an email from my heritage that said, the, they had dig, not only digitized, but they had indexed all the records in the Azores. And uh, so the person made a joke saying like, uh, you know, uh, how many Jose Salendas would be there in the Azores? And so I, sitting there with my computer, went on to MyHeritage, and I searched the name, and the answer was 6,376 that were indexed, you know, and the person just did not, you know, they didn't want to know. They passed it off. But my heritage has done a wonderful job indexing places. One of the things that they did that's very useful to us uh, for our immigrants that came to America is the Ellis Island records. And everybody ends up looking through the Ellis Island records. And they're a great resource. However, it is a much better resource now. My heritage did something that nobody else had ever done. 
not only did they scan the front page, but they scanned the flaps and the back of the page. And so what they did is they added 9.8 million more names to the records. Now, these were not all people that immigrated here, but that some of them were names of the person where the immigrant was going to live whether it be in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Massachusetts, it put families together. In doing my wife's research, we found her great grandfather had come over from uh, Poland. And we knew basically when the family came, we, we have a record and we have the ship manifest of the wife and the nine month old girl, but we did not have him and we couldn't find him. Now we understood through family history or family stories that, well, you know, he probably used an alias because he was AWOL from the Prussian army. And so, uh, you know, he may have used another name and that even wasn't true. He did come three years or two years later. And I, because of what my heritage did, we were able to find his name on a manifest, we know the name of the ship he came on, we know when he arrived, and that was great. We can now put the family together. Unfortunately for him, he was only in America three years before he was killed in a bar fight. And uh, that was the end of the story for him. And we didn't find the family again for another 20 years afterwards. Now the one I have on the upper left there, Family Search, they are free. This is what the Mormon church has put together. Um, they just made an announcement recently that they have finished digitizing all of the microfilm that they've had there in their mountain, and they are now available on Family Search. Now, not everything they have is available uh, to the general public. Uh, sometimes you have to go to a Family Search affiliate library. I'm not sure if the, uh, if the Drinket Library there is a Family Search affiliate or not. We are down in Brockton, so that gives us access to some records that you generally can't get to. But FamilySearch.org is a free site. It's fabulous. You just have to create an account, and you have access to everything there. So if you were on Ancestry.com and you were doing a pedigree chart, uh, this is a, a little snippet of my family tree, um, and that's me in the middle with my good friend Stanley, Lord Stanley. When the Bruins won the Stanley Cup in 2011, I got to have my picture taken with it, and uh, I've seen Stanley a few other times uh, up at the Hockey Hall of Fame, but that is my official picture uh, that I use uh, for just about everything. Uh, the others I hadn't added the pictures at the time. I, several other people I've added pictures for now. But Ancestry.com, they transfer what we see on paper there a few slides ago, the pedigree chart. Here it is online. Now, I always talk about family search first. I'm doing a lecture in a few weeks' time at a different library on internet resources. And essentially what I'm using is my free internet resources. It is much better to use things that are free first before you start spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars on subscriptions. Um, years ago, there was a TV commercial um, about searching the internet and the guy was bored and all he did, and he finally, the conclusion of it was he had reached the end of the internet. Um, sometimes you feel like that when you're working doing genealogical research. Uh, there got to be a time when I thought that I had found everything I could ever find in family search. There, there was a time when I thought I had found everything that I could possibly find in Ancestry. Well, the good news is they are adding all the time. They are adding new records. Now, I have in here the second line, a great place to start preserving your family tree online. A lot of people use it. Personally, I do not recommend it. Um, 
not on family search. One of the problems is a security issue. Anybody out there that has a similar relative to you, and maybe they have different information than you do, they can change your records on you and you are not notified. So this, I did a little one out there years ago and that was happening quite frequently. They kept changing the birth of my grandmother. And I don't know why, but they kept doing it. They were always two years off. And I have other people that have said the same thing. So uh, it's to me, I don't recommend doing your family tree there. Uh, it, it is a great place to do research, but not to hold your online family tree. So again, you can access the imp information, you can import and export, and that's a good thing. So we have this thing called GEDCOM. Many, many people freak out when they hear it, but GEDCOM is a tool, it's a standard by which you can transfer genealogical data from one program to another program. I do it all the time. I do my work in Family Tree Maker. I then export it to a GEDCOM file. I then import that GEDCOM file into my, into legacy. And, uh, and then I do my reports and it has all the information, all the information transfers. Now, what about if you have pictures? Well, keep all your pictures in one place. That's an important thing. And the information, the tag will transfer over as well. And then it gives you the opportunity to share your tree with others, or you can print your family tree. There's some rudimentary printing on uh, family search. So it's a little perk. You've spent no money. This is one of the big things. It's amazing what you will find out there that is available for free. So here's familysearch.org. And again, very simple how you add things. Now, this one is really early. This, I have to confess, this is a really early slide. The only person I have on there is me. I haven't added my parents yet. I haven't added a wife yet. It's just the fact that I would have my name on it. That's it. Now, there are other people over here on the far right that are some distant relatives. Now, again, I've looked for them. I search for them on Family Search, and uh, I have a third cousin down in Maryland who is from this Peel family, and uh, so we've been able to piece together. And it really is when I started working with other people and checking out what they had in their trees that it really expanded mine. Now, my family. Um, primarily is from Canada and Eastern Canada, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland. And most of them came over from England. Oh, now we're starting to see finally the uh, Scottish roots showing up. Uh, I have a son that lives in Ireland and he said, dad, you got to find somebody that lives in Ireland to prove that we're part Irish. He says, it'll help me get my citizenship. Well, the only problem is, is I know, where his grandparents were born. All right, one was born in North Sydney, Nova Scotia, and uh, the other on my side was born in Port of Aston, Newfoundland. And then on my wife's side, they were all born in Chicago. So uh, it doesn't help. He doesn't qualify for his Irish citizenship that way. He has to go about it the uh, long, difficult way. And he's working on that. He's got about two more years of living in Ireland and he'll qualify. So that's good. But anyway, so back to family search. And again, it is a very useful tool. Now, whether you're using the pedigree, the paper pedigree chart or an online one, you start with your information. And ladies, always go back, always use your maiden name and enter your known vitals. All right, I know we enter our birth date, you know, uh, marriage date, divorce date, if that's applicable. And we fill in this basic structure. Then we need to start adding documents to prove it. So if a person is married, 
there's a good chance that somewhere in their house they have a copy of their marriage certificate. If somewhere along the line they got divorced, I, I know confidently that somewhere there's a copy of the divorce decree that they have that can be a part of the proof of existence. Oftentimes we have our birth certificates. Uh, I have multiple, like I said, multiple copies of my birth certificate. I have um, the French long form. Um, I have it in English. I have a little credit card size birth certificate that I had to get when I was a kid because I wanted I was playing hockey and all of a sudden they made a rule that had to, you had to prove that you were born. Now, I know the fact that, you know, I was on skates and I was out there playing was kind of proof enough to me that I was born, but the, the league officials wanted to have a birth certificate. And so we had to get one. I had to order one. And uh, again, to do my passport and all that. Uh, that little credit card size one is very handy to carry around in your wallet, but it has no legal value. You need to have the long form. Even the short form is of no value. When uh, our youngest son wanted his Canadian passport, um, we had a copy of the short form. That's all we had and found out that it was inadequate. So we had to submit and, uh, the money and request the long form. And of course it came in French. And of course that didn't help down here because he needed that for his driver's license. He needed it for his US passport. And so we had to go get it translated. Now again, translating a French birth certificate is pretty easy. There are no hard words. And uh, when you have a copy of it in English already, it's very easy to translate but you have to pay a translator to do it. Now, one of the interesting things that's difficult for us to get a hold of is when you're recording dates, you want to record in the European format, day, month, year. Um, now, oftentimes we abbreviate um, the month and usually we only use three letters. So September, although when we abbreviate it now, it's S-E-P-T, it's just S-E-P. So three letters for the month. Again, you know, think about June and July, you just drop it off that fourth letter. It's just one too many. And that's, the, but that's the European format. And that's how you should record all your dates. Again, you fill in what you have, you can go back and edit it later on. When you're looking at a location, you know, for me, it's like, okay, I'm in Brockton. Now, if I say that to people in Massachusetts, they have a basic idea where I am, you know, 20 miles southeast of Boston. But you want to put in the exact information, Brockton, Plymouth County, Massachusetts, USA. And we do the same thing when you're dealing with international excuse me, in international addresses, you put in the full information. Now, if you're using a software program, it will fill that in for you. If you're using the online tree maker with um, ancestry.com or myheritage.com, um, it will fill that in for you automatically. But you want, again, on paper, you want to, I would seem like that's a lot of extra writing, you know? Brockton, Mass, and 02301. Well, there's a couple of zip codes here in Brockton, but this gives very definitive, and this is the way we should do our records. Now, <clears throat> record what you have for the record on your pedigree chart. So make a little notation on it. I have the birth certificate. I have the marriage certificate. I have the death record. Um, now, sometimes we have problems. You know, we think about my wife's family, they're Polish. Um, if you know that they were born in Poland as we know it today, it may be that the town that was in, now in Poland may have been recorded somewhere else, like in the Kingdom of Prussia. That border changed all the time. Uh, and there were different kingdoms that were in charge. And so 
when you're going back to look for records, you may have to be looking in a different country in order to find the records that you were looking for. So again, uh, if you know they were born in Poland, but it was in a time period when it was actually Prussia, then record that it was Prussia. In the notes, you can put, say, it's modern day town in Poland, uh, but only in the notes, not in the official records that you keep. Of course, you know, what do you do next? You do spouse, uh, children, we do parents, and of course, our siblings, and the same thing, you do the same thing for the spouse. Uh, it, it, the, it really gets wide. Now, in my family, my dad was an only child. So doing his parents and him was a piece of cake. Now, my grandfather's brother who lived up the street, Frederick, and his wife, Lottie, they had 18 children. All right. When I got to theirs, it was a lot of extra work. I mean, because there were 18 births. Now, I have no idea how Aunt Lottie uh, bore 18 children. She to, today is the most petite woman that I've ever met in my life. And yet in their house, they had up to 14 children living in there at one time. Uh, she had, they did have a number of children that died very young, a week old or two weeks old. Um, but again, they count, you record them, you record the birth and the death. So you've added a whole bunch of people to your family tree. Of course, you know, with Uncle Fred and Aunt Lottie, that was, you know, 20 people I could add to the tree, all in one fell swoop. It looks impressive. But the big problem is you have no proof of anything. Just because man said so does not make it so. Now, some of the information that my grandmother had I have now proven to be incorrect. Some of the information that my cousin did in her work 40 years ago, I have proven to be incorrect. That was not my intention to prove that she was wrong in what she did, but it is as we found reports. Now, again, this all stems with my great-great-grandfather, who is William Reed, but he also had another name. He, he also went by Joseph Reed. Now we find out why. Um, in 1839, he and his wife, Anne, were married. And they were married by a traveling um, Wesleyan missionary who was going the circuits on horse to the different communities to be the minister for a couple weeks, and then he would move on to the next town. And so I found that record which targets right in about the time of all the births and that and all the children that they had. But in the early 1850s, I believe it was 1852, they converted to Catholicism. And in order to convert to Catholicism and be married in the Catholic Church, they all had to be baptized. So the parents and all the children, five of them, I think at the time, all got baptized. We have their baptismal records. And then we have, you know, that all took place in the morning. And then in the afternoon, William and Anne got married in the Catholic Church. And we have a copy of that marriage record. And when he got baptized, he took the name Joseph. And so hence part of the confusion. Same people, but they got remarried in, you know, to each other uh, in the Catholic Church. Now, because we have all this documentation, this is vital. We have proof. Everything that my cousin did 40 years ago was speculation because there was no proof whatsoever. So find the documents. So sourcing your records, okay, this is important. It's hard work. Uh, make copies, whether it's a picture uh, with our smartphone or scan the document. Uh, you can upload the picture to your online tree. 
it's proof. When I go out there looking and searching through someone's tree, uh, I find an interesting name. And the first thing I do is I click on sources or media and to see what kind of proof they have. If they have no proof, I just, that's it, I'm gone. I go, I go look for somebody else that might have something. I have found a lot of great documents from my own family tree by doing that. Um, finding pictures. Oh, I have a cousin that just flourishes with pictures. And so I've been able to get some great photos of different ancestors from her that she is, she is the photo detective for me in our family. And, uh, you know, it's really added. I think now I have over 1,800 photos uh, in my family tree online. Now, many of those are Im images of documents because as nice as it is to have a picture to see what somebody looked like, I need to prove that they are who they are in my tree. So this is the hard part. This is where you, know, you start putting in a little bit of extra work. So what are we looking for? Where do we look for these things? Birth certificates, marriage certificates, divorce decrees, death certificates. Now, depending upon where your family, your ancestors live, the information on some of these documents may be pretty sketchy. Uh, usually on the marriage certificate, it has the names of the parents of both parties that are getting married. Well, that's great because that puts you back a whole different generation. The death certificate, it does that as well. It gives the name of the parents of the person that has died. Now, there could be some very weird ones. And I have one in my family. My great grandfather. Richard, that I'm named after. When he was born in 1860, his father, William, had already died. He drowned at sea a few months before he was born. His mother died in childbirth. And he was, as the family story says, tells us, he was given to his oldest sibling to raise. Now, we have no idea. This is the one sibling we're missing. We can't find this sibling. We know his name is Alexander, but we can't find any records for Alexander. And how do we know it's Alexander? Because on my great-grandfather's death certificate, the information was provided by my grandfather to the mortician saying, okay, here's who his parents are. And his parents were Alexander Reed and his wife, uh, Mary Crocker, I think it is. And they were looking at it. It's like, well, why would he say that? Why wouldn't, why wouldn't he pass along the fact that his real father's name was William and his real mother's name was Anne? And it's because he never knew them. He, he, his father was already dead when he was born, and his mother died in childbirth. And whoever raised him would have been considered his parents. And so that's why it's important. So the death certificate is very intricate. Um, not only does it in Nova Scotia tell you these vital information, it also tells you what their career was and when they last worked. So when did they retire? So it has there that my great-grandfather was a ship's carpenter and that he retired at the age of 70. Uh, he died when he was 92. And it tells you the cause of death. It was a brain aneurysm as a result of a fall. Obituaries find a lot of information. Those are great. You can find them in different sources. Newspaper articles. Uh, I love newspaper articles because you find out about them. Again, I'm trying to find out what they did for work, you know, where they, where they fit in the social calendar, if you want to call it, of their community. Uh, census records obviously are very valuable. And then any photos, diaries, family Bibles. Uh, sometimes you can find correspondence letters. Those, were, those are great. A lot of personal information in there. 
So document these sources. Now you record what it is and where you got it. I just had somebody email me on Ancestry asking me about a particular document that I have on my family tree. And they asked me where I got it. So I'm looking at it and I'm going like, I don't know, I've had this thing for years. And so they got pressing about it. They were really getting pushy about it. And I go like, so I had to start digging back into my memory and going like, a distant third cousin, third or fourth cousin sent it to me probably six or seven years ago. And that's all I know about it. I do know the information is accurate that's on that document because I found other documents that prove what's on it is right. But they, they were getting like, well, who was it? I want their name because that looks like something I did, you know, 10 years ago. And I'm like, I, hey, if you did it, I'll give you credit for it. But, um, you know, hey, I don't remember the person's name. I talk to hundreds of people every year, sometimes it seems like thousands about genealogical research. So I can't remember where I get everything. But record as much information, particularly for official documents. And always get a digital copy, whether it's a photograph or you know, an image that somebody has. Um, that, and you keep that. You don't need to go spend all the money to get the original birth certificates and death certificates. A image is sufficient. The only time you need the official documents is if you're applying for a foreign passport or something. So what do you cite? Sometimes I find information in history books. So I want to put down the author, the title, what page it was on, when it was published, um, sometimes you may be able to get the information of what the uh, library call number is uh, for the book. And then any information that just sort of helps show where you got it, um, particularly the repository, if it is an unpublished manuscript. You know, there's just a copy of where, where did you find it? Um, and there's a lot of them out there. There's a Oh, what's it called? Archives.com is a site where you'll find a lot of what were once unpublished documents, but now they're published online. Um, so you give credit where credit is due. If you found the information on a CD-ROM, on a database, here's, here's some examples of how you would record it. And then also if you find it on the internet, you give the website. Now, when you give a website as a source information, it is very important that that last piece of information I have there accessed the 11th of November, 2003, all right? Because guess what? It could have changed. They could change the way they organize their website and that link would not come up with anything at all right now. It would just give you a 404 page not found error. So you have to record when you found it uh, on there. Now, uh, uh oh, there it is. I remember the name now. When I run into this problem, where somebody sources a website and they can't, it, it doesn't work anymore. There is a place out on the internet. It's called the Wayback Machine. And the Wayback Machine takes pictures on capture sites on particular dates through the year. And so I've actually been able to use the Wayback Machine to find documents and the way a website looked 20 years ago. It's really cool. Uh, but again, this is for your citation, your proof that what you have, are saying about your family is true. Now, an online census. Uh, you could say it came from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or more likely Family Search. And if this is a particular book or transcript of it, 
it does say that it's found in family search in ancestry at the very bottom of each document they give you this information as to where the source is but i add in access 23rd january 2009 i add in that information so that again it is very possible that Ancestry would change the way they structure their website and this information would not be there today where it was, you know, 12, 13 years ago. Now, I don't know about you, but I work with to-do lists. I love to-do lists. Uh, on my computer, I've been using a program for a better part of 20 four years as my calendaring program and my to-do list. It has a unique name. It's called Time and Chaos. It costs $49. It comes out of New Zealand. You buy it once, you use it for life. Um, it has saved me many, many heartaches uh, because I record everything that I do on. You know, if I change the oil in a car, it's on there. Uh, you know, if I take out the trash, it's on there. It is my ultimate to-do list for the day. And uh, you can create a to-do list for your genealogical research. As much information as possible. Now, um, I think it's the third point down. Uh, write down where you might find the information, such as ask my cousin George the birth date of his mother. Or find Aunt Betty's burial location in a headstone. Uh, you're, it's something that you're looking for, but you don't have the information and you have no means to find it. So you, you, you start thinking about who can I check with this? Who can I ask? Now, if you have anyone of Irish ancestry that settled in Canton, Mass in the mid 1800s, and never, you know, you have no evidence that they moved anywhere. It is likely that they died, when they died, they were buried in what we now call the Old St. Mary Cemetery at the St. John Evangelist Church in Canton. Now, that's a very large cemetery, but it has two parts. It has the Old St. Mary's and it has the St. Mary Cemetery. In the St. Mary Cemetery, they have a record of everybody that's buried there. But in the old St. Mary Cemetery, all those records were lost. They had no clue who was buried there. So back in 1992, there was a group of seven people that knew each other and had interest in Irish research. And they went and they went through that cemetery headstone by headstone and transcribed what was on every headstone. And we have since digitized that. And we have used it many times to help people find family members. In fact, one of our prized, I call it now one of our prized possessions at the David Allen Lampert Library and the Friends of Irish Research is a portrait from the late 1800s. A family from New York related to this young lady uh, brought us, let's pass winter, the picture from New York and uh, we will get it refinished and get it hung properly on the wall. Um, she is somebody who died at a very young age, probably about 22, 23, in the late 1800s, I think 1892, 93, she died. And she's actually buried in that St. Mary, old St. Mary Cemetery. And we have her in our database, in our list that was transcribed back in 1992. Um, this is cool. I mean, this is just, it's, it's unheard of type of find. Uh, these are the types of things you're looking for. So when you meet with your, as the family gatherings, you know, particularly those that are um, elderly now, have, have a list of questions, start asking them, you know, because it, it's, they've got valuable information. When you're questioning your relatives, be very precise in your questions. One fact at a time for each question. 
you know, ask such things as when somebody was born, you know, did they die young? Do you know, did, you know, do you know where they, if they died, do you know where they're buried? You know, because once you have that basic information, and again, that's not what I would call concrete proof about them, but it gives you a place to look. So now you can go back to familysearch.org and now you can tighten your criteria for your search and find, likely find the information. Keep a log. Now, uh, this is one of those things where I'm going to say, do as I do, do as I say, not as I do. I'm lousy at keeping the research logs. Uh, most of what I do is uh, online, although I do have resources and you know, volumes and volumes of books that I can scan through to try and find information. Um, our library has over 20,000 digital books. Those are really easy to search. Control F and you can search any PDF document. Um, yeah, track down the records, town records. Um, find out, there was one I was doing research for for somebody and found uh, you know, here's what they did. Uh, they were hired to remove snow and they were paid $5. Or they were hired to repair a bridge. They were paid $25. Uh, these are public records. So um, our town halls, our city halls are valuable sources for us. Uh, don't worry about annoying the clerk. Uh, you know, the records are there. And they're there for you as a citizen to be able to access. So here's the research log. You just track what you did. You know, uh, you were looking for something, you didn't find it. Actually, that tells me more than where I found something. You know, so uh, it tells me where not to look in the future. I don't want to duplicate my work. So here's a completed research log. And, uh, a lot of information there. And again, uh, you see far right, there's one there, the document number where you're looking at a particular document and the page number, uh, when the archives open up again, and we're able to go there. You know, you need to go in and ask for very specific things for them to be able to pull it out for you. <clears throat> So talking to family members, again, a very uh, useful um, tool. Uh, photographs, I remember getting a large collection of photographs. They meant nothing to me. But when I was up visiting in Nova Scotia, I took the stack of photographs and I had my dad go through. He was able to identify almost every single person. And so I brought my little portable scanner and I scanned it. And I kept the log, okay, image one, this is who it is. Image two, this is who it is. Image three, and so forth. Um, very valuable. Now, one of the things I like to do is I like to share. Um, I share my information with others. Uh, I am not worried about others taking things from my, uh, my tree. Uh, I, I am so glad that somebody uses a picture that I found and take it and they use it on their tree. I have no problem with that. Some people do, but I don't. So here are some sample documents. This is the stuff that you're looking for. Here's a marriage record. This is the marriage record of my dad's parents, my grandparents. Now we knew when they were married, as in what day, what month. But they never ever shared what year. And it was interesting that when I found this document, which was not on Family Search, but is now, I found this in a collection um, at the Cape Breton Genealogical and Historical Association. They have a large collection and uh, found out, you know, okay, uh, the ages. My grandfather was uh, 30 years old. My grandmother was 22 years old. And... Uh, it's got all the basic information there that is really useful. And, and then we have the date. And it was the date that got me. Uh, they were born, uh, married on May 2nd, 
1933. My dad was born June 3rd, 1933. So she was eight months along when they got married. That was, that was one of the little family secrets that she never shared with us. Uh, this is my brother's uh, baptism certificate. Kind of interesting, gives us uh, basic information. Now, this birth certificate, or sorry, baptism certificate is different than the traditional ones that you're thinking. This is a baptism certificate in a Baptist church where he is older than it's not an infant that's being baptized. So this baptism certificate could not be used as an alternate to his birth certificate. Now, in the United Church of Canada or the Catholic Church or the Lutheran Church, um, that baptism certificate can be counted as a birth certificate. In the census, you find out all kinds of information. We're starting to get all excited about the 1850 census. It's going to start, it's going to soon be ready for us. I remember the excitement when the 1840, or sorry, 1940 census came out. People were just waiting to find something. You know what? Uh, the 1950 census comes out. I'm not going to be in it. It's going to be a long time before I get a census record in the U.S. where I show up. But a lot of valuable information. The death certificate, this is my great-grandfather's death certificate. Again, it gives me all the pertinent information. If you look down on the left column towards the bottom, it, that's where we find Alexander Reed and Mary Crocker. Who in the world are these people? Well, it's his oldest brother and his wife, the ones that raised him. And we have uh, over on the far right in the middle, it's a cerebral hemorrhage. So we have the cause of death. This is a family photo. This is pretty interesting. Now, in this picture, the, the older couple to the right are my dad's parents. The ones on the left are my mom's parents. This is one of the rare times that they were, that they were all together. And we have my three siblings. The short little blonde kid, Mark. Next one down now in the tan pants and the green shirt. That's my brother, Terry. And the little one up in the my grandmother's arms is my sister, Karen. And I am the pant leg on the right, left. That's all it shows. I don't know if somebody who took the picture was not really pleased with me at the time. Uh, maybe I had a funny face on. But uh, my parents did a very sad thing that I just... It scares me when I see this happen is they dressed siblings alike. So my brother and I often had the same type of clothes. So, and there you can see, well, the only evidence you see for me is, you know, half of one leg of tan pants. But a family photo is very useful. Now, newspaper articles are great. Now, this is one of my sons. This is Daniel. Um, Two years in a row, when we were in Dover, New Hampshire, we went to the Apple Fest, and he was the front page picture for the Apple Fest, two years in a row. And he, he was cute back then. I get I know why they killed him there. This was uh, shortly before my mom passed away. We were able to get up and visit, and her, nine, and her and dad's nine grandchildren were all together. I now have them beat because I now have 10 grandchildren. Uh, but this is the first time that they were all together in one place. Uh, headstones, lots of great information. Um, the one on the left is Emmanuel and Dinah Strickland. And that would be my great grandfather. I think on my mother's side, the manual string. Now it gives Dinah Strickland kind of interesting. It, it, she was, they, they only put her married name there. And again, that's kind of a, 
a hard thing to deal with at times. But that is in a, a small cemetery in Newfoundland. Obituaries, again, lots of vital information. Um, here we have, let's see, who is in a major? Now, when you see a name in there, uh, the major family, that was kind of a, uh, an interesting one because um, in it, it was the major family shows up in both my mom's and my dad's trees, two generations back, two brothers from one family and two sisters from another family uh, married. And so it intersects. And so the only way I can keep that straight is on paper because there's no software that does that properly. It makes it look, so I, in, in software, I actually have two Cyrus majors with all the exact same information. Portraits, this is my great uncle Joseph. He, he was killed in World War I. Um, if I were to oh, reach over here, I could pull out and I hear I, I have his medals from World War I. And uh, I'm quite an honor to have that. Public Book of Remembrance in Canada. Uh, I was able to go visit Parliament Hill and go up the Peace Tower, and there they have a Public Book of Remembrance. And this, on this particular sheet, um, we find Joseph Richard Reed um, when he was killed uh, in France. Sporting events. Really old photo. The guy, the guy over in the far right, that's my dad. He was in the, U, uh, the Canadian Air Force. Now, his technical job was he was a radar technician, which is pretty funny because he has no technical abilities whatsoever, but he was the basketball coach and player. This is kind of interesting. You find out that your fifth great-grandfather is Vice Admiral Sir Admir Edward James Foote of the British Royal Navy. Interesting things you find. Here are my sixth great-grandfather, Morgan Schnook, a ship, a ship captain. He worked for Captain James Cook. Captain James Cook was commissioned to uh, do a map of uh, Newfoundland and uh, the coastline. And he would go in and he would hire uh, local sea captains to work with him for sometimes just a couple of weeks. And uh, my sixth great grandfather did that. So the time has come for you to gather your materials, start organizing them, start documenting them, start entering your information either in paper format or in I prefer a software program, and then publish your family tree. So we've been at this a while. I have not been doing this for 100 years, but the members of the Friends of Irish Research, when you put all our genealogical time together, it's over 100 years. Uh, we can't wait till we uh, open up again. Um, we now have the library here. Um, it is growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, on our website, you can actually go there and see all the books that we've cataloged so far. Over, I think it's over 6,500. Uh, we have 100 boxes of books that we need to go through and journals um, to catalog and get on the shelves. And yeah, if some of us take this seriously and try to uh, involve with several Irish organizations and also uh, in Newfoundland and in Nova Scotia and in Quebec, uh, if you have any French Canadian in you, um, it's a gold mine up there. The Druan connection, um, collection, uh, it will take you back into the 1700s and sometimes into the 